In this video, we're going to go through chapter three of statics, equilibrium of a particle. So this is where in statics, we first start an, like the analysis of real systems. So in the first chapter, it just talked about units and measurement. In the second chapter talked about summing vector vectors and getting resultant vectors and then doing that, that same process with force vectors. So with those fundamentals, now we come to chapter three and we start analyzing real systems. Okay, and one of the one of the main purposes of this video is we want to go over all of the different free body diagrams they show for uh, for particle equilibrium. Free body diagrams are, are so important. And so before we get into um, start working problems, it'll be really helpful to review all the ways they draw free body diagrams for, for these for these systems. Okay, so by so a particle we're talking about just like a point in space. And so all of the free body diagrams that we draw in this chapter can be represented as a point. But obviously there's no such thing as a, as a point. We're dealing with physical objects. But we can do this, we can model it this way because all of the forces that are acting on whatever whatever body we're analyzing. So let's say, let's say we're, we're looking at this ring here. The line of action of all of the forces meet at a point. And so we can just model, do a, the free body diagram of, of, that, of that body, of that piece, can just be modeled as a point and you can draw the forces acting on the point. If the, if all, if, if the lines of action of all the forces didn't meet at a point, then we'd have a different system. And we'll talk about that kind of system in, in later chapters. And th this, this in particle equilibrium comes into play a, a, a lot of the time when you're dealing with, with chains and, and ropes and slings and springs. And the reason is, we talk about this in another video, is because forces and chains and springs and slings the line of action of the force has to be along the axis of those of those those components and so if you have something that's connected at all ends by chains and or, or ropes or some combination of some combination of chains ropes and slings you end up with you end up with this particle particle equilibrium all the the lines of action meeting at a point it's also important to note that so you could have a ring some sort of connecting piece Like this, so you've got a let's say a force from a cable coming from the top, and then two forces at the bottom. The lines of action meet at a point. So this is particle equilibrium, but as far as like the relative to the the, the center of mass. The center of gravity of this ring, which which would be at the center, the center of mass and the, and the the point where the the lines of action of the forces meet is not the same. It doesn't have to be for particle equilibrium. For a dynamic case where the sums of the forces aren't zero, it's a little different. But so so we're, so we're just talking about equilibrium. The sum of the forces are equal to zero. So again, the the lines of action of the forces meet at a point, but they don't doesn't necessarily for for equilibrium. Some of the forces equal to zero that point doesn't have to be the center of mass of the element that you're analyzing. You can still just take this, take this point right here, take it out and do your, and, and, and do your free body diagram that way on this ring. Okay, so what does it say here? Condition for the equilibrium of a particle. A particle is said to be in equilibrium if it remains at rest, if originally at rest, or has a constant velocity if originally in motion. So if it's not accelerating, then, the, then it's in equilibrium. But most often, however, the term equilibrium, which I, it's static equilibrium, is, is used to describe an object at rest. To maintain equilibrium, it is necessary to satisfy Newton's first law of motion. Okay, so the equilibrium equations, the sum of the forces, are equal to zero. That, that's applying Newton's first law. The object is at rest or, or constant velocity. That, that means the sum of the forces on it are equal to zero. That's Newton's first law. The vector sum of all the forces on acting the acting on the particle. That's what sum of f sum of the uh, forces is. 
Well, actually, the 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 sum of the for, when you sum the forces and use the the sum of the forces is equal to an m a and a is equal to zero. That's Newton's second law. Newton's first law just says an object at rest tends to stay at rest, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion. So this is more of Newton's second law with a is equal the acceleration equal to zero. Okay, for the equate to apply the equations of equilibrium, we need to draw free body diagrams. Okay, but before they talk about free body diagrams, they want to talk about two types of connections that are often encountered in particle equilibrium problems, springs and cables and, and pulleys as well, pulleys as well. So spring, a spring is just an element where the, the, the force on the spring is a linear function of the displacement, of the displacement of the spring from its equilibrium position. And that, that, the, the, and that there's a constant of proportionality that, that establishes that linear relation of, of, of K. Okay, now cables and pulleys, right, the line of action, springs can support tension or compression, but the line of action of the force is always along the axis of the spring. You, 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 don't, you never have springs that are, have components of forces that are pulling, you know, that, that are bending the spring or twisting the spring. Okay, cables and pulleys, unless otherwise stated throughout the book, cables or cords will assume to have negligible weight and they cannot stretch. Also, a cable can support only a, a tension or pulling load. And this force always acts in the direction of the, of the cable. And then we'll talk, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about pulleys in detail in Chapter 5, but you can usually assume that a pulley is, is frictionless so that the tension in the cable is constant on either side of the pulley. The tension is the tension. But you could see, you know, if you had some extremely corroded pulley that was like that was like seized or locked up, and there was a lot of friction between the rope and the pulley, then maybe it's so locked up that you've got like a slacked cable on one side and a highly tense um, and a highly tout cable on the other side, so the tensions aren't equal. But usually the loads are going to be so high in the cable relative to any kind of friction force in the pulley that you can assume that, the, that the, the, the pulley is frictionless. And you can also assume that there's not going to be any, the weight, the, the load is so heavy that there's not going to be any sliding of the rope on the pulley. You know, the, the, it, would be, it would be a nice rigid, you can look, think of it like a rigid connection between the, but, but the interface between the rope and the pulley. But we'll talk about that more in Chapter 5. Okay, so the, yeah, the free body diagrams, you must account for all of the forces acting on the particle when applying the equations of e equilibrium. So you isolate the body from its surroundings, completely from its surroundings, and then and then draw all of the, the contact forces and, and the body forces, like the, the body forces being like the weight, or if there's magnetism or something, right? So here, you've got the, the, the two cables, and then the weight acting at the center, the center of mass of the, of the, 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 the center of the, of the piece. They all meet at a point so you can draw it you can draw the free body diagram like this or you can you can even you can remove the body and just have a point here and and because when it comes to cables springs ropes chains because you the because you know the line of action has to be along the axis of that element you, you know i mean based on the geometry of the problem so as long as they give you dimensions and or you know if if, if a lot of the time you'll know this this angle let's say 25 degrees or whatever you can you know the where the force is acting it's along the line the line of the long line of action of the of the piece okay so here's an example problem so they've got all this stuff going on on in this system you can see how they how they draw a free body diagram of this this mass here there's the there's the rope force, and there's the weight. And then they also separate out this little piece of, of rope here. And you can do that with rope because you, you, when you're, you, you're analyzing a system, if you're analyzing a system with ropes, slings, springs, chains, it's going to be tout. That's why, you know, it's under load. So that's, that's kind of the frozen system in, in time that you're analyzing. 
And so you can like pull out pieces of the chain and, and their tout orientation and, and draw a free body diagram on them. And it'll be usually be a, a simple free body diagram because again, they, they can't support any bending or twisting. So it'll just be one force at each end of the, of, of the part of the piece that you took out like this here, nice and simple. You can also see how the, the author just separates this knot here, just isolates that knot and then has the forces on the knot from, from this piece of rope here, this piece of rope here, and this spring here. And you know those lines of action. You see? So you can do that as well. He just makes a, just cuts this out right here. And then we cross over right where the, the spring and these two pieces of, of rope are coming into, into the knot. Okay, coplanar force systems. So it's important to recognize when you're dealing with a, a planar system. So there's no, none, none of the forces acting on the particle have components in the Z direction or, or the Y direction or the X direction. Just it's only in two along two axes. And so in that case, you're only summing, you're only, you're, you're only doing the Newton's second law in the X and Y direction. Okay, here's more examples to solve this problem, they, they take out, they do the free body diagram of this ring here. See, the ring is in particle equilibrium. There's just, there's rope. There's only, the only forces that are contacting this ring are rope. The weight of the ring is negligible compared to the forces. That makes sense, right? I mean, you've got this huge crate. This, 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 the weight of the ring is negligible. Okay, here, here's another ring. It's a, a cable and springs in a, in a spring, so you can separate out the ring. Okay, three-dimensional force systems, exact same concept. It's just now you have components of, of the forces. You're dealing with com component forces in all three directions. You, you might have two forces who are just in one plane, but then there's a third force that has a component in, in, the, in the Z plane. So now it's three, that means it's three-dimensional, but you just you do the exact same thing. You could have a you could still have a, a spring. The cables are still, it's still along, the forces are along the axis of the cables, but it's just in three dimensions. So you, you do Newton's second law in along the X, Y, and Z. Okay, here's a, yeah, so here's like, here's a free body diagram where you can see that the lines of action of the forces wouldn't necessarily meet at the center of mass. They would probably be, they would probably all meet kind of at the lower end here of that piece, but still just particle equilibrium. Okay, so here in this problem, they isolate this knot or whatever this, I think that's a knot, and do a three-dimensional force equilibrium balance. Here they isolate this connecting piece. Here they isolate this knot. All right, and then again, just they take out this this knot here and do the free body diagram. So it's always with particle equilibrium. It's they isolate knots, not, connecting knots, connecting rings, connecting pieces, pieces that they're, they're connecting one side of the system of that has chain springs links to another side that ha of chains links springs etc. They're connecting kind of two two sides of the problem. All right, so, okay, so chapter review. Particle equilibrium, when a particle is at rest or moves with constant velocity, it is in equilibrium. This requires that all the forces acting in the particle form a zero resultant force. In order to account for all the forces that act on a particle, it is necessary to draw its free body diagram. This diagram is an outline shape of the particle that shows all the forces listed with their known or unknown magnitudes and directions. Okay, and I forgot to mention this. But when you do your free body diagram, so you isolate your, the, the, your, your piece, you establish the X, Y, and Z axes, and right, you do a, make a right-handed coordinate system. Then you label all of the, the known and the unknown forces, their magnitudes and directions on the diagram. For, for all of the forces, even the unknown forces, you have to get the direction right. Unless it's unknown, then you just put like the theta or whatever or a variable. You don't know it. But if, if the directions are known, so by the direction, I mean, you know, that this is this force here that 
the angle, it's, it, it's angled relative to the Y axis. You know, it's angle relative to the Z and it's angle relative to the X. If you know that, then you have to get that angle right. You have to put the right angle. And you'll know it, a lot of the times you'll know it because again, the, you know the line of action of the force is along the, um, along the direction of the spring or the cable or the chain. A lot of times you'll have the dimensions, like the, you'll have, they'll give you the dimensions of, of the configuration. And, and so the, then you just use geometry to get these, these, the direction of the force. So even if the force is unknown, if, if you can, if you have the information to put the right direction, then you need, you need to put it. If the force is known, Let's say you know the if you know the magnitude of the force, and again it's, it's going to be for these problems it's going to be a, the force in a chain, a spring, a cable. Then you also need to get the the sense of the force right. So the sense being whether it's acting this way or this way, you have to get that right, and you'll be able to get that right because you know that like cables and chains can only support tension, and if you have a spring and you know the the force in the spring, well, you'll know if the spring is in compression, if it's a negative force in the spring, you'll know, then you'll know the sense of it. So you have to put the right sense. You have to, for, if you know the magnitude of the force, you, then you have to put the sense right in these problems. If you don't know the magnitude of the force, you still have to get the direction right, but you can just put whatever sense you want. Just guess the sense, right? It says the sense of a force having an unknown magnitude can be assumed. And then if the solution of a force yields a negative result, then this indicates that its sense is the reverse of what you assumed. Okay. All right, so back to the chapter review, two-dimensional equilibrium. The two scalar equations of force equilibrium can be applied with reference to an established XY coordinate system. The tensile force developed in a continuous cable that passes over a frictionless pulley must have a constant magnitude throughout the cable to keep the cable in equilibrium. Okay, so that's, you, you, you can, unless they specify you're dealing with a frictionless pulley, so they all throughout a continuous cable, the tension is the same everywhere on either side of the pulley. That's important to know for these problems. If the problem involves a linear elastic spring, then the stretch or compression S of the spring can be related to the force applied to it. Okay, so sometimes you'll need Based on the dimensions, you'll have a spring. And so you might need to take advantage of the, if you know the force in the spring, then you know the deflection in the spring. And so you can use the, that, that deflection information to, to come up with more equations to help you solve for unknowns. And we'll, and we'll show examples of that in upcoming problems. Okay, if the three-dimensional geometry is difficult to visualize, then the equilibrium equation should be applied using a Cartesian vector analysis. This requires first expressing each force on the free body diagram as a Cartesian vector. When the forces are summed and set equal to zero, then the i, j, and k components are also zero. So yeah, I mean, what, three dimensions is it, it's once you know how to how to how to work in two dimensions, three dimensions is the exact same thing. Just you have an extra component. You could you know you'll still you could still have a spring in three dimensions. It's all the same. It's just a little. It's a little more complicated because you have these extra components, but it's the exact same analysis as as you did in two dimensions. All right. So next, we're going to work a bunch of example problems, particle equilibrium example problems.